I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Zolaire or omelizumab, first approved in the United States in 2003 for asthma. And then it was granted approval for chronic hives, chronic urticaria, in 2014. As far as asthma is concerned, it's for allergic asthma. So in people over age six who have either a skin test or a blood test that's positive for an allergen, and whose symptoms are inadequately controlled on standard medicine, at least using the inhaled corticosteroids, then this might be an appropriate treatment. It is not treatment for acute asthma. Now, originally in 2001, the company Genentech and Novartis thought that they might be able to get approval for treatment both of pediatric and adult asthma and pediatric and adult seasonal allergic rhinitis, but the FDA was a little skeptical, so they only granted them approval for moderate to severe persistent asthma, originally in people over age 12 with the positive skin test, who were taking medicines but not adequately controlled, because the FDA was a little bit concerned about maybe some signs of some early stage malignancy and maybe some anaphylactic responses. And subsequently, they became a little concerned about the slight increase in the incidence of heart attack and stroke and chest pain and blood clots. Well, asthma obviously is a significant disease. Maybe 10% of children, 8% of adults, about 30 million people in the United States. Asthma is an episodic airflow obstruction due to inflammation in the airways that ends up causing a cough or chest tightness or shortness of breath or wheezing. Severity is variable. And if a person has the obstruction, it's at least partially reversible. So usually a person who inhales a medicine like albuterol, we call it a short-acting beta agonist, well, they're going to show significant improvement. They're going to have at least 12% improvement in the amount of air they're able to get out, around 200 milliliters of air. So that's all good. And these people who were treated with the Zoller have allergic asthma. And allergic asthma is at least 50% of people. Now, the symptoms of allergic and non-allergic asthma are pretty much the same, but as far as the perennial inhaled allergens that cause this asthma, the perennial asthma that is subject to Zolaer, these are the people who are allergic to dust mites or pet dander or molds or pollens. There are a bunch of other reasons for asthma, too. Well, this is not for people who have seasonal allergens. People who have hay fever or are allergic to a blooming plant or to some sort of a tree allergen. There's a wide variation in how doctors treat asthma. And Zoller is for people who have failed other kind of therapies. The treatment setup for asthma is regulated by something called GINA. GINA stands for the Global Initiative for Asthma that was established in 1993 by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the World Health Organization. They say there are five steps in the treatment of asthma, one, two, three, four, and five sequentially, and Zoair is only for people who are at stage five asthma who have moderate to moderately severe asthma of at least one year duration, who have the positive skin test, and then have a blood test for the allergy type of immunoglobulin we refer to as IgE, and it should be at least 30 to 700, that should be how high it is, could be up to 1,500, and the person's body weight is less than 330 pounds. It's more effective in people obviously with severe asthma than in moderate asthma, and it's important to realize that at least 20 to 30 percent of adult asthmatics don't have allergies as the reason behind their asthma. Now, you can't keep measuring the IgE, that allergy immunoglobulin, because once it's up, it has a tendency to stay up even on therapy. So that seems to be the real culprit. You have high levels of the IgE, the allergy antibody, and then you inhale or somehow come in contact with something that triggers that chemical and it binds and then it releases some potent mediators in the eosinophils and the mast cells and other cells and that leads to swelling of the airways and that causes the symptoms. So obviously a good treatment would be to do something and inactivate the ability of that IgE to work. Well, how does Zoware work? Is Zoware really a home run 
No, not really. Is it a good treatment? Yes, it's a good treatment. So in one study, looking at people who were taking the standard kind of treatments using the inhaled steroids and oftentimes using a long-acting beta agonist, well, people who received Zolair had an average of one attack per every five patients as opposed to people receiving the placebo, one attack in every three or three and a half patients. Another study showed that, again, Zolaire, one attack in every five patients, but in this time, one attack in every two and a half patients receiving the placebo. Were people able to reduce the dose of steroids? Not really when they were taking this medicine. Did people have a massive increase in the amount of air that they could get out when they were taking the medicine? Not too impressive. How about the symptoms? Were the symptoms, the daytime symptoms or the nighttime symptoms improved? Yes, but again, not all that impressively. So when it comes to the effect of the medicine in adults and also in children, it seems the medicine is okay but not great. And it's a pain in the neck to use this kind of medicine because the dose varies, not only with the individual's weight, but also with the level of the IgE, that antibody, that was determined before therapy begins. So the dose could be anywhere between about 150 milligrams and 375 milligrams injected underneath the surface of the skin, either monthly or every two weeks, depending on your weight and the level of that immunoglobulin. Now, you could give yourself the shot up until May of 2008. At that time, the company requested that the injections be given by a healthcare practitioner because of the potential for very severe anaphylactic reactions. Now, the medicine comes in other countries in pre-filled syringes. In the United States, it comes as a lyophilized powder, a powder in a, in a little bottle, and you have to dilute it. Well, once you put the dilution medicine in there, then you swirl it for five or 10 seconds, and then you wait, and you do it again, and then you wait, and you do it again. And it usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes to dissolve the whole thing. It might take up to 40 minutes, takes longer than 40 minutes, you get rid of it and do again. Well, up to 150 milligrams could be injected at one site, but depending on your body weight and depending on the level of immunoglobulin, you might have to get several shots. Now, once you mix the medicine, you can keep it for up to eight hours in the refrigerator or up to four hours at room temperature. The solution's pretty viscous, so it takes a little while, five, 10 seconds, to go and inject it. And periodically, when a person's on therapy, they should be reassessed to decide if the therapy is still necessary. I mentioned that it also was approved for chronic idiopathic urticaria, urticaria, not seemingly due to an allergy to strawberries or allergy to aspirin. Just don't know exactly why people get this kind of a condition, but about a million and a half people in the United States have it, more common in women by a factor of twofold compared to men. Most people develop it when they're somewhere around age 20 to 40. It's not good for other types of urticaria. And, and most of these people who have this chronic idiopathic urticaria have taken the antihistamines, but they don't seem to do any good. Well, how does the medicine work? The medicine, again, seems to work relatively well. Now, unlike the people who have the asthma, who have a dose that's dependent on their body weight and the IgE, in this case, the dose is either 150 milligrams or 300 milligrams, depending on which seems to be better. And for most people, it's the 300 milligram dose. But it doesn't completely get rid of the hive. So if we look at the end of therapy, well, about a third of the people at the highest dose are going to have no itch and no hives. But two thirds of the people who are treated still going to have hives and still going to have itch. So um, it's not the greatest for that either. But it does come with a black box warning, a black box warning that says a person might develop anaphylaxis, presence as bronchospasm, difficulty breathing, the blood pressure falls, develop hives, swelling of the tongue, could occur with the first dose or could be delayed. And that's why at the present time in the United States, 
it's suggested and recommended that the treatment be given in a doctor's office as opposed to most of the other medicines that don't have to be. Well, there are other kinds of side effects associated with Zoware, so you could have some arthralgias, pain in your joint, or you could have pain in general, leg pain, and you could have some fatigue or dizziness. Some people develop abdominal pain or itch or skin rash or earache or nausea or sore throat. But overall, the reactions seem to be about the same as people who were given placebo, but about 40% of the people can develop a problem right at the site of reaction, lasts for about an hour to maybe up to a week, less with subsequent therapies. Rarely people lose hair, maybe sometimes people can develop low levels of platelets, those chemicals in the blood that are associated with the clotting. But there was a study that came out and suggested that there was an increased incidence of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular injuries. It was 13% among people receiving the drug and only 8% among people receiving the placebo. That's not what we want. Transient ischemic attacks in 7 tenths of a percent versus basically no one in the placebo group heart attacks in a little more than 2% versus less than 1%, unstable angina in more than 2% versus about 1.5%, and then there was elevation of pressure inside the pulmonary artery, we call it pulmonary hypertension, and then the people who were receiving the treatment were somewhat more likely to develop pulmonary emboli or deep vein clots, no change in the incidence of ischemic stroke or in overall cardiovascular deaths. And the numbers were small, that's true. The company tried to rebut the potential for a negative public reaction on this. They performed a trial, and the trial didn't show any kind of cardiovascular problem, but the trial was kind of short. It was only about seven months, and it had relatively young patients that we wouldn't expect to have any kind of problem. So does it really give us uh, resolution that, that we don't have any kind of problem? No, there is always that lingering doubt about the medicine. And by the way, it said that there's a slight, slight increase in the incidence of cancer with the drug. So from some of the early trials, they were uh, able to show a small increase in the incidence of from 0.2% with placebo to 0.5% with the medicine in cancer of the breast or the prostate or the parotid gland and skin cancers, both melanoma and non-melanoma, usually starting within a year of therapy. Did it have anything to do with the medicine? Don't know the answer to that. Probably not. Some confirmatory studies were not able to show the link, but it's something to we all have to consider. Well, you have to remember that this drug is not for the treatment of acute asthma, may cause serum sickness-like reactions, and certainly if a person has a history of infection with any kind of a helminth, like a roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, threadworm, or a tapeworm, flatworm, or fluke, not all that common in most of the United States, some down in the southern part of the country, and certainly in other areas of the world, in Brazil, 50% of the people have infection with these kind of problems, these parasites. So those should be treated first. And remember, once we begin therapy, we don't follow that IgE anymore. It doesn't seem to go down necessarily. There were some adverse effects reported to the FDA. As a matter of fact, there have been 16,000 plus cases of severe reaction and 1,100 deaths associated with the Zoware therapy. Now, these are all voluntary reports. And even though they were reported in patients receiving the Zoware, there's no specific cause and effect that can be gained from that. So we don't know that the Zoware was responsible. We just know that the patients were taking the Zoware and they had those kind of reactions. Now, the medicine is probably not a good idea in pregnant women, but we know that pregnant women who have asthma can have significant problems, or their unborn infants can have significant problems, not good for people who have or are breastfeeding, but we don't really have information that it would be harmful. 
it's grown in Chinese hamster ovary cells. And, and in the culture, there's a little bit of gentamicin added. Now, it's not present in the final product. So people who are allergic to gentamicin have severe allergies, probably don't have anything to worry about. The medicine has a long half-life. It lasts for about 26 days in the system. It works because it can inactivate the IgE's ability to function. Remember, it's not used as a standalone therapy. It's not used in the treatment of acute asthma. It has an interesting history. It was developed by a company known as Tanox in 1987. It was a small company in Houston. They had the idea that they should develop an anti-IgE. It wasn't well received. They didn't have a lot of money, but they finally got some backing from Siba Geige. That was a big pharmaceutical company that later became Sandoz, that later became Novartis. And they had a collaborative agreement, and they did some studies. And in 1993, Genentech, they were working on an anti-IgE molecule for asthma. The problem is that Tanox sent their chemical to Genentech in 1989. And then subsequently, Genentech is working on the same kind of thing, so that obviously led to a lawsuit and trade secret violations. They settled out of court, and, and the whole group of them actually further developed the medicine until Genentech bought out Tanox. Well, the USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism in March of 2016 had a whistleblower charges of illegal sales schemes associated with the marketing of the drug. Questions about kickbacks and bribes and misinformation about unapproved uses and perhaps some insurance fraud is what they were claiming. And they said that the sales reps were often presenting some off-label uses of the medicine. It was sold for mild asthma, not the severe asthma. It was sold as a first-line drug rather than an add-on. They were calling on pediatricians. and They were telling doctors that they really didn't have to inject it in the office. And they were showing how to fudge on medical necessity and upcoding and all. Well, that was settled. They didn't go to court on that one. So the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in Europe, in England, they said, you know, this costs an awful lot and we don't have a sufficient increase in the quality of life for us to put it on the market over here. Well, they went through some hoops with Novartis and they finally allowed it for certain restricted reasons. The lot of insurance companies have specific limitations on who can use the medicine for how long and how often it has to be re-upped or how long it has to be re-approved. They're testing it for nasal polyps and according to the company, they might be ready to ask the FDA for approval in 2020 for that particular purpose. This is a big seller and it's expensive medicine. The cost for 150 milligrams, cash cost, is about $1,100. That means if you need the 300 milligram dose, it could be about $2,200 or $28,000 a year or $77 a day. Now, even though the medicine's been on the market for a while, in January of 2013, the price was, cash price was $784. They moved that up in 2015 to $866 in 2016, up to $923 in 2017, up to $987, and at the present time, as I mentioned, about $1,100. So just since, 19, uh, since uh, 2013, they've increased the price of the drug by over 40%. So Zolair, it's a drug for two purposes, for asthma and chronic urticaria if it's being used for asthma, should be at least moderately severe asthma or severe asthma of the allergic type, and it can provide significant benefit for some. But it's obviously not a home run. It's a pain in the neck to administer, have to be in a doctor's office because of the potential, even though it's small, of an anaphylactic reaction has a variety of other side effects as well. There's the question about the cardiovascular problems, question about the cancer. So we have a drug 
that works okay. For some people it's going to be a significant improvement. For most people it'll be mild to moderate improvement. For a lot of people, mm, it's just a so-so drug. Anyway, I'm Dr. Ken Lando and I thank you for watching. Thank you.